glorious Christ. Your son, whom you gave to rescue us from our sin, to rescue us from ourselves, ultimately to rescue us from a broken world, to rescue us from your own wrath. We are grateful in these moments. We will be forever grateful for what you have done for us. God, we need your thoughts. We need to think about ourselves and about the world the way you do. We, by ourselves, would not live rightly. We would not think rightly. And so we're dependent now upon you, upon your word. We thank you that your Holy Spirit is active, involved in the lives of all of your children, renewing us day by day, conforming us from one glory to another, ultimately into the image of your Son. And we pray that you would use your words this morning, the sword of the Spirit, even to that end, for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want you to imagine for a moment a simple math problem on the page at your desk. Two plus two equals, you're thinking it, four. Yes, that is correct. Imagine for a moment that the twos on your page began to dance. And in their pirouettes, as they spin, the two turns backward and more closely resembles a five. And now the answer to the question is seven, until it spins back and it's four again, and, and round and round the two goes spinning, and you're not sure which equation to look at. Your simple addition problem uh, becomes much more difficult. Imagine that someone is interfering with your paper, and they're throwing in multipliers, and uh, they're adding brackets, and, and little numbers here and there that change the equation every few seconds. It would be difficult to predict what number would be the result. And then, of course, the dog comes by the desk and snatches your math homework from the top of the desk and eats it whole. Now, this is not real math. This is frustrated math. I thought there were rules. I thought the numbers had to stay the way they were. What is this outside interference? Somebody bent my math homework and... Who can unbend it? Right, if only the world worked like 2 plus 2 equals 4. Put some data in, the same conclusion comes out every single time. We don't live in a world like 2 plus 2 is 4. If someone has bent the world. And who can unbend it? If we live in a broken world. Ecclesiastes 7.13 has already told us who's responsible for putting it out of shape. Ultimately, it's God. As a consequence of human sin, we, we have a God who is sovereign over all things, whose ways are unpredictable. He shall not be tamed. Good things in life fail to produce lasting happiness. If this is good, why if I attach my life to this good thing, does it not produce lasting good? It doesn't work that way. I can't boil life down to a simple cause and effect because I'm a sinner and I live in a world populated by other sinners who don't think right, who don't do right, who interfere with all my plans. Listen, I want a formula for guaranteeing outcomes in life and, and all I get is vexation, frustration, to use Solomon's word, hevel, futility, a chasing after the wind. How do we respond to such a world? Well, do nothing. If I can't predict the outcomes, then what's the use of doing anything at all? If I can't guarantee that this cause will produce this effect, why engage in any endeavor whatsoever? The proper response to the kind of world we live in, frankly, is a pity party. Or just laziness, or... Just a mope. Well, of course, that is not Solomon's conclusion. 
Although we might make that logical leap on the basis of the theology of the universe we live in that Solomon has been presenting through this book of Ecclesiastes. But it, as we near Ecclesiastes' end, Solomon is going to rescue us from where we might naturally go in our logical deductions. And Solomon is going to give us a theology of life, a theology of doing something, a theology of fun, right here in our Bibles. Now, what does Solomon command in Ecclesiastes 11? Not moping, not a pity party, not a sit down and do nothing because life is frustrating and can't seem to produce the results that I want, but rather an intentional, trusting, hopeful, obedient, worshipful pursuit of enterprise and fun. That's what Ecclesiastes 11 is all about. I'd love for you to turn there with me this morning. We'll read it together. And here are God's words through Solomon. Cast your bread on the surface of the waters, for you will find it after many days. Divide your portion to seven or even to eight, for you do not know what misfortune may occur on the earth. If the clouds are full, they pour out rain upon the earth. And whether a tree falls toward the south or toward the north, wherever the tree falls, there it lies. He who watches the wind will not sow, and he who looks at the clouds will not reap. Just as you do not know the path of the wind and how bones are formed in the womb of the pregnant woman, so you do not know the activity of God who makes all things. Sow your seed in the morning and do not be idle in the evening, for you do not know whether morning or evening sowing will succeed, or whether both of them alike will be good. The light is pleasant, and it is good for the eyes to see the sun. Indeed, if a man should live many years, let him rejoice in them all, and let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. Everything that is to come will be futility. Rejoice, young man, during your childhood, and let your heart be pleasant during the days of young manhood, and follow the impulses of your heart and the desires of your eyes. Yet know that God will bring you to judgment for all these things. So, remove grief and anger from your heart and put away pain from your body because childhood and the prime of life are fleeting. This chapter is in your Bible. If we ask the question, how am I supposed to live in an unpredictable world? Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter 11 gives two very practical, very helpful bits of advice. The first one is, do something. And the second one is, have fun. Do something and have fun. This is an unpredictable world. And we might sum it up, as I said a moment ago, Solomon here is enjoining us to an intentional, trusting, hopeful, obedient, worshipful pursuit of enterprise and fun. Let's look at the first bit of advice in verses 1 to 6. Do something. Solomon begins for us in verse 1, Cast your bread on the surface of the waters, for you will find it after many days. The last time you cast your bread on the waters, you were feeding the ducks in the local park. Right? What is this about? What do you mean, throw your bread on the waters? What, what good is that? The verb is simple. It just means to cast or to throw. And, and Solomon is talking about bread. I think here he means bread as in goods or as in your livelihood. Uh, this is how bread was referred to in Deuteronomy 8.3 uh, when Moses said, man shall not live on bread alone. He doesn't mean simply that produced in an oven uh, as the product of wheat, uh, but food, but sustenance. In Proverbs 31.14, the, the woman described there is like merchant ships and she brings her food or her bread from afar. Uh, bread is used as this word to describe the, the commodities, the resources. And Solomon says, cast it on the surface of the waters. My best guess at what Solomon means here may refer to his own merchant navy. In 1 Kings 10.22, we read this. The king had at sea the ships of Tarshish with the ships of Hiram. And once every three years, the ships of Tarshish came bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. 
What was Solomon doing with a merchant navy? He was sending his investment, his resources, out on the seas to gather treasures, commodities, things to, to bring back and trade with and, and, to, and to show off in his house. Yeah, but there are risks at sea. Solomon could have used the resources that he had and, and just sat on them. You, you could take the bread that you have in a given day and just eat it. And Solomon is commending for us something else. Cast it out upon the waters. In other words, let loose some of the things that you own for the purpose of patiently waiting for them to produce more. This is an investment. It, it is an understanding that life is full of risks, and Solomon is enjoining us to realize those risks. Every endeavor comes with risk. You could just go ahead and eat your livelihood right now, or you could invest it. And Solomon says, it will come around after many days. As Solomon's advice here is forward thinking. It is a reflection of patience. I don't believe Solomon here just has in mind financial dealings, financial investments. You and I could think along these terms in all kinds of endeavors. Think about your evangelistic opportunities. Well, I have the gospel. That's good enough for me. Or you could have the gospel go out from you, out from your household to other places and see what God does with it. See what comes of it. To approach this with job opportunities, float out some resumes and see what comes of it. The pursuit of a wife, you young men. Solomon's advice here is just try something. Don't be paralyzed by the frustrations of the curse. You can think, oh man, the open sea, the Bermuda Triangle, there's storms. What if there's a hole in the boat? What about a giant squid? You could think through all of these things and... Solomon's not denigrating the reality of risks, but he says, take them, take them. There's a benefit to that. Just try something. He's not commending a, a hunker down like a Y2K prepper, but get out of the bunker. Do stuff. Be enterprising. This continues in verse 2. Solomon says, divide your portion to seven or even to eight, for you do not know what misfortune may occur on the earth. And here Solomon expands the idea in verse 1. It's not just get out there and do something, not just send your bread across the ocean, but pick seven or eight ships. This is a commendation of diversification. This fits a regular pattern in Scripture when he says, divide your portion. Literally, he says, give your portion to seven or even to eight. Well, which is it, Solomon? What is the magic number for portfolio diversification of investments? Is it seven investments or eight investments? Uh, you've seen this pattern in Scripture before. It's the X plus one pattern to describe an indefinite number of things. Uh, Proverbs 6.16 is an example. Six things the Lord hates, seven which are an abomination to Him. Well, does God hate six things or seven? Well, there's a lot of things God hates, and I'm going to list six or seven of them. The implication is there are more. We're not talking about an exact number here. But don't put all your eggs in one basket. Get several baskets. And this would apply to financial investments, to employment applications. You don't set your heart on one job and spend all your time and all your energy just applying for that one job and then give up when you don't get that one job. Well... I didn't get the one I wanted. Cursed world, Genesis 3, Ecclesiastes 7.13, it's bent. Who can straighten it? No, send out multiple applications. <laughs> Look for several jobs. This has to do with any of our hopes or dreams or aspirations. Listen, you and I have no idea what's going to happen. Solomon says it this way, we do not know what misfortune may occur on the earth. So, you don't set your hopes and your desires all on one thing and as if, if I don't get that one thing, my life's over. Frustrated world, cursed world, Ecclesiastes, Genesis 3, wait for heaven. This is true of friendships. Make friends, make more than one friend. Try different recipes. <laughs> Evangelistic opportunities. You might be praying for one person in particular, but share the gospel with everybody. Let's see what happens. 
Life can be so disappointing, especially when our expectations are set on two plus two equals four. That's the way it should always work. Well, don't forget about the dog that steals your math homework. And those, I, I don't know, pirouetting twos turn to fives. That, that's never really happened to me. But. Look at verse three. Solomon continues this thought. If the clouds are full, they pour out rain upon the earth. And whether a tree falls toward the south or toward the north, wherever the tree falls, there it lies. The lesson here is in your enterprising activities, in your endeavors, don't expect to be able to control all of your circumstances. Don't expect to be able to control all of your circumstances. There are things outside of our control, and Solomon paints this picture with two examples of things we cannot control. The weather and the falling of a tree. We might try to control the weather. Scott Demarest and I were uh, landing in Beijing on the way to, to western China when the Chinese government was seeding the clouds with silver iodide. And they were doing that in preparation for the Olympics that were to be held the following year in, in Beijing. And, and they wanted to be able to control the weather so that the smog in the cities could be eliminated by a rainstorm. Clear out the smog with the rain, then everybody can see we have a beautiful city with no pollution. Uh, the problem is that the silver iodide they were testing, uh, it, it made it snow while Scott and I were there. And then during the Olympics, you may have noticed that all the outdoor activities were nearly rained out because they couldn't control it the way they wanted to. And they wanted to make it rain before the Olympics, and it rained during the Olympics. Our best efforts, we, we can't really control the weather. You might try to control the falling of a tree. One of my neighbor's trees is in the process of falling over. You think, what do you mean in the process of falling over? Yeah, it's like halfway like this right now. You know who you are. <laughs> my other neighbor on the other side wanted a tree taken down, and Jeremy Lehman and I, good neighbors, decided to go over, and we'll put some ropes, we'll attach some things, we'll, we'll really set this up, and we'll cut... I mean, Jeremy is phenomenal. He knew all the angles to cut all the limbs just right so we could make the limbs go right where we wanted them to. And we couldn't make them go right where we wanted them to. The tree fell where it wanted to fall. Listen, the clouds are not going to ask you when and where to unload rain. And the tree is not going to ask your permission to fall, nor will it ask your input about which direction. They're just things we can't control. We need to lower our expectations. Look at verse 4. He who watches the wind will not sow, and he who looks at the clouds will not reap. Sort of a family phrase in, in, in my home comes from my great-grandfather, who in a blue sky with not a cloud on the horizon, and then, and then one little peep of a cloud just starting to form, he'd say, clouding up, looks like rain. And, and the person who says, Way out on the horizon is a cloud coming. Not a good day for me to plant my crops. I don't want to get wet while, while I'm out there planting seeds. And so he freezes, paralyzed. Solomon says, don't be frozen by a paralysis of the hypotheticals of what might happen possibly. There are things we can't control, we need to get used to that, but not paralyzed by it. Those who wait for the perfect circumstance, the open door, those who count every eventuality, who prepare for every contingency, can overthink, can fear, can be paralyzed by anxiety, the paralysis of the what if, frozen by the hypotheticals. Listen, there will always be a good excuse to delay what we should be doing. Imagine all the difficulties so we never do anything. I can't control the weather. But you can control what you should do. Go plant your crops. Or at harvest time, harvest your crops. But what if? Don't worry about the what ifs. Don't let them freeze you. Go do what you need to do. One writer has said, Few great enterprises have waited for ideal conditions. Solomon goes on. He says in verse 5, Just as you do not know the path of the wind, and you do not know how bones are formed in the womb of the pregnant woman, 
so also you do not know the activity of God who makes all things. Now, we certainly have progressed since Solomon's day in our investigation and our medical technology and our ability to sort of see how things work, but we only get so far. At every level, at every science, at, at every discovery, it only leads to more questions of, okay, yeah, but how does that work? Why does it do it that way? I think the, the formation of a child in the womb is one of the most staggering examples of complexity and mystery and the amazing ingenuity of God. Now, go ask Jake Hantla sometime about what it means for a child to be in an all-water environment and then to transition into a non-water environment and survive the transition. A staggering, complex array of chemical reactions that must take place in the right order, at the right times, in the right way for all of that to happen. The nurses in the room are smiling. It's staggering. We, we don't understand these things. And let the great mysteries of science be a lesson to us about the limits of our knowledge and let them promote in us a humility. Just as I don't understand what God understands about how the world works, Solomon says, so you do not know the activity of God who makes all those things. Listen, we can't understand the things that we can see and touch and feel. How much less do we understand why God does what he does, why he does it when he does it, or how he does what he does? We don't understand God's dealings. What is our response to that? We are to be humble and obedient. Right? God tells us this, Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to Yahweh. But the things that he has revealed are for us and for our children so that we might teach them and so that we might do them. God's infinite knowledge and our puny brains are a reminder to us that we are to be humble and dependent and obedient. God knows what he's doing. I don't know what he's doing. I don't even know what I'm doing. But I can trust him. I must trust him. Someone has said this about our knowledge. To dare to believe less or to pretend to understand more than God has expressly revealed is equally profane presumption. We should study to be wise, not above Scripture, but in Scripture. Not in the things God has concealed, but in what He has revealed. That's appropriate. And so if my limited knowledge of the inner workings of all things keeps me from doing, keeps me from engaging in productive enterprise, right endeavors, if, if I say, well, I don't know enough to, to move forward, what I'm really demonstrating is an elevated view of myself, that I will act, I will do what God expects me to do, I will do what I should, only when I am good and ready, and I will be good and ready when all the circumstances and all the information conform to my standards and my expectations. That's a wrong view of ourselves. Some might say, well, since I don't know how things will turn out, I just shouldn't do anything. And Solomon is commending a different approach. Since I don't know how things will turn out, I should just do something. And we're to let Scripture be our guide as to the kinds of things we should be doing. The right response to my limited knowledge is found in verse 6. Sow your seed in the morning, and do not be idle in the evening, for you do not know whether morning or evening sowing will succeed, or whether both of them alike will be good. There's something I don't know, but there's something I should do. What do I not know? Is morning sowing going to work? I don't know. Sow my seed in the morning. Is evening seed planting going to be successful? I don't know. But i got to plant my seed in the evening. Why? It's really simple. If I don't plant my seeds, nothing will grow and I will starve. <laughs> Just because I can't predict the outcome of the fruit of a given seed doesn't mean I shouldn't plant it. If you want to eat, you got to put the seed in the ground. Do it. Just because you don't know how things are going to work out in a broken world, just because you can't tame the sovereignty of God, it doesn't mean you should be lazy, apathetic, but rather active. If you're looking for a guaranteed outcome to your labors, you're in the wrong world with the wrong expectations. Now, this takes obedience and trust, humility, 
and faith, to do what I should do when I should do it, and to leave the results with God. To admit my lack of knowledge, diversify my efforts, and make sure that I do what needs to be done, plant in the morning and plant in the evening. Since there are risks in a fallen world, a cursed world, a broken world, and since God is sovereign and His ways are untamable, what should we do? Give up on life. Solomon's advice to us is this, it is better to fail by trying than to fail by fearing failure. It's good advice. I tried getting a job, but I didn't get hired. I tried sharing the gospel with people, but no one listened. I asked a girl out on a date, but she said no. I guess I'm, not just, I'm just not made to get a job, share the gospel, or get married. Solomon's advice, do something. Trust God and leave the results to Him. The second bit of advice in Ecclesiastes 11, simply this, have fun. Have fun. Here we find in verses 7 to 10 a theology of fun. We might call it a funology. This is a sober commendation of enjoyment as worship. A sober commendation of enjoyment as worship. Now, this may be surprising. Listen to Solomon's word in verse 7. The light is pleasant, and it is good for the eyes to see the sun. How has Solomon been talking about the sun in Ecclesiastes up to this point? Under the sun, vanity. The sun beats down on the laborer, Hevel. There's been a negative view of the sun, and yet here, look up at the sun. It's been a long, cold, lonely winter. (laughs) Enjoy it. The light is pleasant. This is more than an advertisement for living in Arizona. If you have friends that have lived in gloomy places, (laughs) you understand the predicament of being locked up, closed in, not seeing the sun for some time, dying for a lack of vitamin D. Right? It's good. The sun is good. You might be tired of it here. I like seeing the sun. Solomon says, it's good. This is a stop and smell the roses kind of advice. Notice the good things in life. Some of us could walk outside and say, oh man, the sun is shining again. It is so irritating. It just beats down on my forehead. People in other places say, oh, the clouds have obscured the sun again. This is so vexing. Rain, rain, go away. (laughs) Solomon is, when there are enjoyable things, enjoy them. Don't take life for granted. This is a beauty that declares the glory of God. So, Praise God for the goodness in life. It's pleasant. It's good. Look at verse 8. Indeed, if a man should live many years, let him rejoice in them all. And let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. Everything that is to come will be futility. And what is the lesson in verse 8? Have fun when God provides it. Have fun when God provides it. If you live long, rejoice in all of your days. Well, this sounds strange given what he says next. Um, Let him also remember the days of darkness, for they will be many, and, and, and everything in the future is futility. Yeah, so rejoice in all your days. This is difficult, more difficult for those who have lived long on the earth. You've seen enough pain. You've experienced enough difficulty, enough for the frustration. You've felt tragedy. And yet, Solomon's command is to rejoice in your days. Listen, this is a a, a balanced or realistic view of the world we live in. There are good things to enjoy, but remember the days of darkness. And we'll get to that more next week. Solomon says, they will be many, and futility is coming But if there is delight in a given moment, don't let it slip by unnoticed. Don't let God go unthanked. You know, if you've ever worked hard 
to surprise a loved one with a good, maybe a costly gift, something you worked on for a long time or saved up for for a long time, and, and you were just sure that they would love it. And after it's given, they, they seem to not even notice it. I, I think that's how we walk through life. Where God gives his son and his reign to the just and the unjust alike, and, and, and we, the recipients of God's unbounded love, just fail to notice it. We just fail to thank him for his kindness. We just fail to appreciate the good things that he puts in our lives. And Solomon won't let us do that. He, he recognizes that there is more to life than sweetness and light. This is a realistic view. There is darkness too. There is vexation too. So when the rose blooms, smell it. Hold on to that experience. That experience is about more than just itself. It is, in fact, a, an indication of the kind of God that we serve. And it is a foretaste of something to come for those who belong to Him. If you live long enough, you'll see plenty of pain. Solomon's attitude is, have fun when God gives it. This requires from us an attitude of faith and gratitude and hope. Again, this is easier for the young. It's harder for the curmudgeons. Look at verse 9. Rejoice, young man, during your childhood. And let your heart be pleasant during the days of young manhood. And follow the impulses of your heart. Follow the desires of your eyes. This is in your Bible. A command to delight in the thrill of living. To enjoy youth while you have youth. Listen, when you were young, you listened to all the old folks around you talk about their knees and their back and their ailments and how they wish they were still 42 or 18 or whatever it is. Strong bodies with few responsibilities. Solomon's command to you in that stage of life is know what fun is and experience it. Youth has an advantage here. Youth is not burdened or slowed down by the discomforts, the discouragements that come with age, kind of like the barnacles that collect on the hull of a ship and slow it down as it moves through the water. And Solomon goes farther. He says a shocking statement, follow the impulses of your heart. Follow the desires of your eyes. Wow. You see something cool? Examine it. You find something fun to do? Experience it. This is remarkable advice. But Solomon can't leave verse 9 and this command unqualified. We dare not miss the command. You must obey these commands. But these are qualified commands. These are guarded statements. Look at the second part of the verse. Yet know that God will bring you to judgment for all these things. He can't leave this advice unguarded. He knows too much about the human heart. God knows too much about us, uh, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the boastful pride of life. He knows our frame. He knows our depravity. He knows the way that we will twist what is good and make it perverted. He knows how we will worship his gifts instead of worshiping him. And so Solomon says, judgment's coming. Enjoy life. Follow the impulses of your heart. Follow the desires of your eyes. And have those two commands governed by the realities of eternity. The realities of divine accountability. Is this the ultimate buzzkill or what? Actually, I believe this is the rescue of fun. You see, the kind of fun, the kind of enjoyment in life, the kind of delights in life, the kind of pleasures in life that can be engaged in without gratitude to God and not slotted into the category of worship of Him 
are not truly delightful. Uh, They may be for a time, but they're destructive. They will kill you. But fun and delight and pleasure, rightly oriented under a devoted worship of God, the giver of all good gifts, totally different thing. And Solomon commends it. His command here and his warning are not designed to suck the joy out of life, but to rescue joy. From his failed experiment in Ecclesiastes 2, and put it under the banner of worship. One writer wrote, The youth devoted to sin is the saddest object in a world of darkness and sorrow. But youth consecrated to God is the brightest. That's right. You young men, you young women, you children. Find things to enjoy and enjoy them, but enjoy them as coming from God. Pursue those delights and those enjoyments that you can, with integrity, thank God for and worship Him in. They're actually there for you. God's good gifts are are not some sort of a trap, not some sort of a a temptation. If you fall into actually having fun, you're going to be condemned. No, the judgment Solomon is talking about, and by the way, it's the definite article, yet know that God will bring you to the judgment for all these things. He's talking eschatologically, the end of all time, when everything will be analyzed, when the secret motives of men's hearts will be seen. When whether one participated in four-wheeling in a mud puddle for the glory of God or four-wheeling in a mud puddle for the glory of self, those things will be revealed. Those things will be analyzed, judged. Solomon continues in verse 10, So remove grief, remove anger from your heart, and put away pain from your body. Because childhood and the prime of life are fleeting. Solomon's advice here is to make adjustments. Feel free to make adjustments about the levels of vexation in your life. He's not taking anything away from his theology of a a broken and cursed and bent world. But he is giving us the freedom to make tweaks, minor adjustments in the levels of frustrations we face. You know, we could just resign ourselves to this. It's a broken world. Work is cursed. Life is hard. So I, I should never try to make any adjustments to my existence. This is Eeyore the donkey theology, right? Eeyore needed a theology of enjoyment. For him, everything was pathetic. Uh, That is not the Christian worldview. That is not Solomon's worldview. To sort of make suffering as a form of heroism, suffering for its own sake, the sort of martyr's syndrome. This was the whole problem with the monastic movement in medieval church history. People thought the path to godliness is self-deprivation. Joy, fun, pleasure, delight is, by definition, sin. And so to be holy, I have to eschew all of those things. Good meals, good clothes. So they would do silly things. Monks in these monasteries, trying to be holy, would go sleep in 30-degree weather in a a, a thin uh, cloak. Uh, They would go without good food, Uh, even self-flagellation. They would take implements and whip their backs because pain is good. Suffering is good. Listen, there's enough pain and suffering in a broken world that God and His good purposes will bring into our lives. That we must benefit from suffering. We must benefit from trials in the way God intends. We don't have to invent trials for ourselves. We don't have to self-inflict pain and suffering. In fact, Solomon says, put pain away from your body. Here's a commendation of seeking appropriate ways to fix physical problems, to ease our pains, to get medical attention. I snapped my arm falling off the monkey bars. Well, it's a broken and fallen world. Now I'm broken and fallen. It's just the way it is. Solomon says, 
make adjustments because life is precious and youth is fleeting. Look at the way he says it. Childhood and the prime of life, they're, they're running away from you. <laughs> you only get one shot at this life. You only get one opportunity at the, at the prime of your life. Use it. We, we live in an era when we can pick our way of life. It hasn't always been the case. Uh, there were times in history and places where you apprenticed under your father and you did whatever he did and that was your lot in life and you did that the whole time. And, and if you were in that position, you could trust God with that. But we're not in that position. Anvils have gone out of style. I don't have to be a blacksmith. I can pick something else to do. I once met the CEO of a large franchised chain of jewelry stores. Sat on an airplane with him for about four hours. He told me that when he was 16 years old, he acquired a pawn shop from his uncle. His uncle said, hey kid, go play with this, see what you can do with it. So he was selling everything a pawn shop sells. And it was a lot of work to sell secondhand clothing and rusty tools that didn't work, and a bunch of cracked uh, vinyl albums. And he realized, you know, the best strategy here is to look at my profit margins. What's going to be less tedium and more profit for me? And so he cut down his inventory to tools, guns, and jewelry. Eventually, he thought, well, nobody's buying the tools, so just guns and jewelry, interesting combination. Then he finally just said, you know, I'm just going to sell jewelry. And then he started buying direct from jewelry importers, and then he became a jewelry importer, and now he has a large franchised empire all over the country. And what was he doing? He was eliminating vexation from his life, looking at what is it that's going to make my job easier and more fun. That's a good strategy. There's no rule in life that says, well, you got a pawn shop where you're 16, you're going to be moving secondhand clothing for the rest of your life. Just stay right there. It's a broken world. That's not Solomon's perspective. I want this morning to explain a little bit about the theology of fun and what it's for. Why would Solomon point us to enjoyment in things under the sun when he's been telling us for 11 chapters so far that everything under the sun is futility and vanity, chasing after the wind? Everything hinges on what Solomon is driving at in the last chapter. We'll get to in two weeks. The conclusion, chapter 12, verse 13, when all has been heard is, fear God and keep his commandments. This applies to every person. God will bring every act to judgment. In other words, get rightly related to your creator. That relationship fundamentally changes everything. The world is condemned in Romans 1 because it worshiped and served the created thing rather than the creator who is forever praised. But for the Christian, God says something like 1 Timothy 6. God gives us good things to enjoy. Remind the rich of that truth. You and I need to have a right view of fun, enjoyment, delight, and pleasure. The misuse of pleasure is bad. And the neglect of pleasure is harmful. How do we misuse pleasure, delight, fun, enjoyment? When it becomes ultimate. When we think that oh, I can have ultimate reality, ultimate satisfaction if I pursue this avenue of pleasure, delight. Listen, it won't work. It can't work. God has programmed the universe so that it will not yield ultimate satisfaction. Whatever experiment you want to try with whatever delight, whatever pleasure, whatever fun under the sun, innocent or otherwise, it will not yield ultimate satisfaction. The universe has been programmed against that. God knows that ultimate satisfaction is only to be found in Him. But he also is the one in Psalm 16 who declares that at my right hand are pleasures forevermore. And those who know him have an infinity of delight to look forward to in his presence. And as a foretaste of that infinite delight, God gives good gifts here. Just think about your taste buds. You can differentiate between salty and sweet and a whole palate and range of flavors. Why isn't food just a chore 
for sustenance? Why is it enjoyable at all? Why do roses smell pleasant? Why are there fun things to do? Why are there delights at all? All of these things come as good gifts from a good God who is not stingy, who tells us all delight is sourced in him. Every good gift comes from above. He doesn't shift. There is no changing shadow in his nature. He is good and he does good. And when you and I enjoy good gifts with gratitude as worship, we are acknowledging that the source of all delight is him. And we are experiencing a foretaste of what is to come. I believe that's what God has designed it for. John Calvin has written an entire chapter in his uh, theological book on what we are to do with enjoyments and trials. Calvin says when you enjoy something, don't be tempted to worship the something, but treat it as an appetizer for heavenly delights. And when you face a trial or something good or something beautiful, something pleasurable is taken away from you, watch your response. If you were holding on to it with a white knuckle grip, it demonstrates that it was an idol for you, not a foretaste of delight in God, not taken with gratitude and worship. You can understand your own phonology when you receive delightful things from God and when God in his good sovereignty removes them from you. How does your heart respond? With gratitude and worship to thankfully enjoy all the pleasures that are lawful and appropriate for a believer in Jesus Christ. That's a good thing. God, in order to secure our place with him for our infinite delight, did the worst thing ever. And he did the best thing ever. And it was the worst thing ever. Where he sent his son, in whom was all his delight, and sent him to a cross to be mocked and shamefully treated, to be beaten, to be tortured, ultimately to be killed, to be treated as a common criminal by mere creatures. And worse than that, to be clothed in all the idolatry, all the evil, all the immorality, all the wickedness, all the deception, all the foul motives, all the stench of all the bad behavior of everyone who would belong to him to clothe himself in all of our wickedness and wear that before his Father so that all God the Father could see in God the Son was our sin. And he inflicted infinite fury, the kind of fury that will come at the judgment for all those who don't believe in him. And he inflicted that upon his Son who endured and satisfied completely the wrath of God for all who would believe. You and I must recognize that when we receive good gifts from God, it is in spite of us. And if they are a foretaste and an appetizer for the infinite delight to come, you must know that that is purchased at infinite cost. God, we praise you that you would look upon the likes of us and be kind, generous, and good over and over and over again. And we lament the ways that we have not thanked you the ways that we have pined after pleasurable things, not from a worshipful heart, the ways that we have enjoyed the good things that you've given us and without gratitude, seemingly without even recognizing that these things are from you. God, forgive us of these things. Help us to walk forward from this day with a, a heart eager to worship you, eager to be thankful for whatever you put in our place, a heart longing for heaven, and knowing that that was purchased for us by the blood of your Son. It's in his name we pray.